Hi, welcome to my presentation on bull breeding soundness, as well as a demonstration of genital pathology that might cause a bull to be declared unsound. I'll start by introducing the concepts associated with infertility in the bull, and then progress to the different methods we can use to assess the bull's fitness to breed. Then, I'll proceed with an overview of the pathology of the male reproductive system that'll be of importance for you. Very importantly, a bull might be infertile as a result of any of a number of syndromes. Basically, we can reduce these to two major conditions, impotentia generandi and impotentia coundi. Impotentia generandi means that there's something wrong with the bull's ability to produce sperm. So the factory, in other words, is broken somewhere. This usually means a testicular problem, but can also reflect epididymal or systemic disease. Impotentia coundi means that the bull is unable to deliver the goods to the customer. This can occur as a result of anything from muscular skeletal pain in an old bull, to lack of confidence in a new bull that's been introduced into a herd. A bull breeding sinus evaluation can rule out many of the causes of these. Further testing might be necessary to isolate a specific diagnosis. Infertility or subfertility in a herd can have a massive economic effect on a farming enterprise. In a worst case scenario, no calves will be born after a full breeding season, resulting in a total loss of income for a farmer. But even if this doesn't happen, the consequences are severe, but they're often hidden. A subfertile bull will, will take longer to get a group of cows pregnant than a fertile bull. This means that if he has got a limited breeding season, there'll be more non-pregnant cows left at the end of the season. There's another knock-on effect. On beef cow-calf operations, farmers are often paid more if they can provide a predictable supply of weaners to a feedlot that are of uniform age and weight. A subfertile bull will result in a wider spread of ages and weights of calves, and that will result in lost income. As vets, we are able to collect data about a bull and then declare that he's breeding sound or not. We can use these four criteria to declare a bull breeding sound. He must be free of disease, have good libido, be physically and genetically healthy, and produce good semen. A breeding soundness report carries with it a lot of responsibility. While you aren't guaranteeing that the bull will produce offspring, you are making a statement, using your professional integrity as collateral, if you will, that the animal you examined on that day would, in all likelihood, be able to perform his function as a breeding bull. In a routine test of a bull, we'll check that the bull is systemically and genetically healthy and that he has normally sized testes. We'll collect a semen sample and evaluate it macroscopically and microscopically by checking mass motility, individual progressive motility and morphology. We'll also ensure that he's free of the important venereal diseases Tritrichomonas fetus and Campylobacter fetus. Once we've done our routine breeding soundness evaluation, we generate a report which we make available to the farmer. It's important that we also keep a copy in our records. A specific piece of government legislation, the Animal Improvement Act, is designed to ensure that the South African national herd, that is, all animals in the country, are selected for fertility traits, and that if assisted reproductive techniques are used, that they'll have the best chance of success. The regulations pertaining to this act specify that at least 75% of a sperm sample from a given animal should be free of morphological defects. As vets, we interpret this to mean that if a bull produces an ejaculate, in that ejaculate there must be at least 75% morphologically normal sperm. If he produces less than this, he fails his breeding soundness evaluation. If a bull is of particular value and has passed a breeding soundness evaluation, he can be subjected to further tests that will assess his suitability as a breeding bull. These aren't routinely done due to cost and time, but they can be done in the case of a valuable stud bull or when it is suspected that the bull isn't performing in the way that he should. Just like the name says, a serving ability test is a test that determines whether the bull is able to serve a cow in estrus. However, a serving capacity test tests his libido and willingness to mate. Any bull that's worth anything will immediately mate with a cow in standing estrus. Impotentia generandi, if you'll remember, is the phrase we use when an animal appears to be unable to produce sperm of adequate quality. This slide summarizes potential causes of that. A common cause of impotentia generandi is immaturity. Farmers will often try and sell very young bulls that may be from great genetic stock, but are too young to be sold. Remember, that young bull is very hungry, and the sooner the farmer can get shot of him, the better. You might well find that if a bull is immature, he will not be producing normal semen, or any semen at all. Nutrition can also influence the onset of puberty. Inadequate nutrition in a mature animal will cause him to be underweight, which will affect semen quality. 
You'll often see that bulls lose a lot of weight over the breeding season, which might lead to a decline in semen quality. This is particularly the case if the cow to bull ratio is too high and the bull is running around a lot during the breeding season trying to get them all mated. Overfat bulls might also have reduced semen quality and diets deficient in certain vitamins and trace elements can affect the bull's fertility. Toxic substances can affect semen quality. Gossipol toxicity can have a marked effect but shouldn't be blamed automatically if subfertile bulls are receiving cottonseed meal because ruminants are quite tolerant. Pyrethroids particularly certain dips, have been suspected to be associated with lower semen quality in bulls. Field observations by some South African vets have cast suspicion on pyrethroid poor on ectoparasiticides as a potential cause of subfertility in certain herds. While fairly uncommon, heavy metal intoxication, if they don't kill the bull first, can have drastic effects on his semen quality. Remember that the testes are typically maintained at a temperature that's around 2 degrees Celsius cooler than core body temperature. Prolonged pyrexia can affect spermatogenesis, which results in a higher proportion of dead sperm and sperm with head defects. This effect might be delayed since the spermatogenic cycle in the bull is 61 days, so you might only see the effects of a pyrexic insult two or so months down the line. An orchitis or periorchitis, which causes localized inflammation in the scrotum, even if it doesn't extend into testicular tissue, will often result in a raised temperature within the testis, which affects spermatogenesis. In West Africa, where dermatophilosis is common, scrotal lesions have been shown to have an effect on thermoregulation. In many cases, orchitis can spread to the contralateral testis, or at least have an indirect effect on spermatogenesis in that testis through its effects on thermoregulation. With orchitis, you might notice the presence of neutrophils and bacteria in the ejaculate, or what we call a pyospermia. However, the absence of a pyospermia certainly doesn't rule out orchitis. A pyospermia in a bull typically indicates accessory gland pathology. Testicular degeneration is a change that occurs as an animal ages. There is distortion of the normal architecture of the seminiferous tubules. Clinically, the testes become soft and the scrotal circumference often decreases. This might be considered normal in very old animals, but in animals of breeding age, this might be a pathological finding. In younger animals, we typically call it premature testicular degeneration. For example, if a 5-year-old bull exhibits such changes, then it would be abnormal, but if he's 11 or 13 or 15, then it might not be. We diagnose the condition by ruling out other potential causes of poor semen quality. There are a number of terms we can use when describing an ejaculate of poor quality. Asthenozoospermia means that there are few sperm of normal motility. Teratozoospermia means that there are many sperm with abnormal nuclei. Oligospermia means there are very few sperm in total, and azospermia means there's a total absence of sperm in the ejaculate. Other than a very low sperm count, a bull with testicular degeneration will usually have soft testes. He might display dystrophic calcification of the testicular parenchyma, which can be seen ultrasonographically. A diagnosis is confirmed by performing a hemiorchidectomy, which is the removal of a single testis, which we then submit for histology. Remember, we don't like to disrupt the blood testis barrier which is why we don't do a testicular biopsy. Impotentia coundi may have a variety of causes, ranging from musculoskeletal issues to poor libido, to penile defects, to aspects of social hierarchy that are found in a multi-sire herd. In turn, libido might be affected by a variety of factors, which we test using a serving capacity test. Often it's not possible to identify the true cause of a poor libido once you've ruled out all other clinical causes. Musculoskeletal problems can affect a bull's willingness or his ability to mate. Injuries are very, very common amongst bulls kept together, but other things like foot problems and arthritis can also contribute. Prolapse of the lamina interna is a very common problem in certain lines of Bos indicus bulls. The problem is caused by an excess of lamina tissue combined with weak cranial propitial muscles which pull the propuse forward. The prepucial conformation of these bulls is configured in a Y shape, so the opening of the prepuce points downwards and towards the ground. When the bull's relaxed, the excess prepucial tissue hangs out of the prepucial opening, which can easily become traumatized. Ticks also like to attach here. Trauma or tick bite induced infection will then cause edema of the piece of lamina that hangs out of the prepuce. Because the prepuce hangs so low and venous drainage is poor, the edema then becomes self perpetuating. 
The traumatized lamina that hangs out of the prepucial opening may dry out and become necrotic with time. Adhesions form which then prevent penile erection. Despite its sometimes dramatic appearance, even quite apparently severe cases of lamina and Turner prolapse can resolve with conservative treatment. For the really intractable cases where adhesions have formed, surgery is an option. Conservative treatment involves supporting the prolapsed tissue to break the cycle of edema that's caused by inflammation. We do this by supporting the prepuce and prolapsed lamina and turna with a hessian sac around the bull's midriff, tied in place with baling twine. This is about 90% of the treatment. The other 10% consists of cold hosing to try and reduce the swelling, ensuring that the sac is fairly clean to try and avoid fly strike, as well as some sort of topical emollient on the prolapse. You can also use a topical steroid, but usually just something like milking balm is sufficient. Acroflavin glycerin can also work. To prevent secondary infection, you can put the bull on broad-spectrum antibiotics like tetracyclines, but this probably isn't necessary in most cases, unless there is obvious infection already. If there are extensive adhesions, which prevent extrusion of the penis, then a lamina interna resection can be performed. This can be done on farm, but for best results the bull should be under general anesthetic. Rather send these bulls to a referral center, like here at Ornestapurt, Remember always only to spend money on surgery if the results of a breeding sinus evaluation suggest that the bull has good semen quality. Prepucial infections are often associated with severe tick infestations around the prepucial opening. If they're chronic, there might be remodeling of the prepucial opening, which will then cause phimosis. A ruptured tunica albuginea is a severe condition that will end the effective lifespan of the bull unless urgent attention is given. In this case, due to rupture of the tunica albuginea, there is a hematoma roughly the size of a soccer ball between the penis and the lamina interna. This will need to be drained, an accurate hemostasis will need to be performed, and the hole in the tunica will need to be repaired. If the bull is a commercial bull, slaughter is generally recommended. But if he's of great genetic merit, surgical treatment can be considered. This is typically a referral procedure, however, so refer him to us at Ornestapurt. Penile tumors are fairly uncommon. In young bulls, they are usually caused by papillomaviruses. They can be confused with penile infection, which is balanopostitis. If in doubt, take a tissue sample for histopathology. In male calves, the skin of the penis and prepuce are fused and separate under the influence of androgens around the time of puberty. Failure of the separation is seen sometimes in certain breeds, usually Angus and Shorthorns, but also Beefmasters and Herefords. If this occurs, we get the condition known as persistent penile frenulum. It's surgically treatable, but because of the possible heritability, we tend to cull these animals. Phalacampsis refers to an abnormal twisting or bending of the penis. Spiral deviation of the penis is the most common form and is caused by abnormal attachment of the apical ligament. A certain amount of spiraling of the glans penis is normal during copulation. During peak erection in an animal with spiral deviation of the penis, the apical ligament slips off to the left side of the penis, which causes a counterclockwise spiraling of the penis. Be very careful to diagnose a bull with pathological spiral deviation, unless it directly interferes with mating. Remember, a certain amount of spiraling is normal. Just because you see a bit of a spiral formation when you collect semen with the electroejaculator doesn't mean that the bull is abnormal necessarily. In this short video, you can see that the bull is unable to achieve intromission because of a premature spiraling of his penis. A so-called short penis is a rare defect seen very occasionally. The bull mounts the cow, but is unable to attain intromission. Remember that just because a bull doesn't extrude what you might perceive to be a full length of penis during electroejaculation, doesn't mean that he necessarily has a short penis. A pudendal nerve block is necessary to relax the retractor penis muscles and allow the penis to be pulled out to its full length. Unfortunately, for bulls with a diagnosed short penis, culling is the only effective measure. 
There might be a genetic component, so collection and freezing of semen is not advised. Of the accessory glands of the bull, the only ones that typically give any issues are the seminal vesicles. Seminal vesiculitis is typically seen in young bulls that are kept together. Often they are being prepared for an auction or a show and are kept on high concentrate diets. Usually, seminal vesiculitis occurs due to bacterial invasion. No clinical signs are apparent in most cases, but on semen collection a common finding is grossly evident pyospermia. If the bull is valuable, antibiotics and non-steroidal anti-inflammatories might be helpful. But always do a culture and antibiogram of a semen sample and select the most potent antibiotic accordingly. A long period of treatment might be necessary to resolve the issue. Unfortunately, in many cases, chronic vesiculitis might occur despite treatment, and this carries a poor long-term prognosis. If the animal is extremely valuable, you might consider surgical vesiculectomy, but this is definitely a referral surgery.